it's great to be here in a city that really cares about transit, as we can tell from the turnout here, and in a city I really enjoy visiting. So it's, it's really fun to be back here, um, fun to see all the buses, fun to see all the trains, and really happy to see all of you, including some people who I talk to a lot on Twitter but don't usually get to see in real life. So very happy to be here. I'm here to talk about my book, Trains, Buses, and People, which is fundamentally a book about transit, what makes good transit, how transit works. Um, and as the title says, it is an opinionated atlas, um, because I think it's really important that we have honest conversations about transit and that we w be willing to point out what works and what doesn't. So this is my life. I'm from Houston, but probably not the Houston you have in your head. Um, right here, you can see the loft I live in. Right there, you can see the building I work in at Hewitt Dollars, doing lots of fun urban planning. And right here, you can see the train that takes me from one to the other. Transit makes my life better every day. It allows me to live a better day-to-day -day existence. And I've discovered transit makes for great cities. And I care about cities, and therefore I care about transit. And there are some very basic reasons for that. Transit is fundamentally space efficient. Um, that if you think about this street right here, all of those cars added together are about 40 people. That train can hold 400. If we want to build cities, and cities are about bringing people closer together, that's what makes things like tonight happen, then transit does a very good job of that. I think we often don't realize just how space inefficient cars are. If you think about the typical employee, their cubicle is actually given less space than the car is given in the parking garage. Um, if we try designing cities around cars, it takes an awful lot of space, which is why if you look anywhere around the world and you see a successful urban center, there is transit at the heart of it. And when we do transit well, it can really transform how cities work and how people live. Neighborhoods like this in Toronto, where a third of households choose to not own cars, or in Seattle, where you've managed to grow population, grow jobs, while actually cutting the number of cars driving into downtown. So what the book does is it looks at all of the metropolitan areas in the United States that have rail or bus rapid transit, and I've defined in the book what I consider to be bus rapid transit, which means full reserve lane. Um, and it analyzes all of them. The book maps every one of these cities at the same scale, population density, network. Um, it talks about which decisions these cities made in building their transit networks. It talks about why they made these decisions, and it talks about which have worked and which haven't. And then at the beginning of the book, there's context, talking about how U.S. transit works, the basic history of U.S. transit, the governance of U.S. transit, and then a section talking about what makes for successful transit. We live in a world now where transit is a normal thing in U.S. metropolitan areas. It's actually rare now for a large U.S. city not to have some kind of rail line or some kind of BRT. Here's actually a chart of rail transit construction in the United States since World War II. We're building this stuff steadily. Every year, there are new rail lines opening up. Every year, there are new bus rapid transit lines opening up. But if you actually look at how they perform, you will notice some very big differences. Here is a chart of transit ridership in the United States. New York is literally off the page at the top. But this is ranked by size of city. And you'll know that, notice that very similarly sized cities have very different levels of ridership. And fundamentally, I argue that is about these fundamental points. It's about density, it's about activity, it's about walkability, it's about connectivity, it's about frequency, it's about travel time, it's about reliability, capacity, and selectability. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this. So let's start with density. Density is the most basic thing in transit. Every transit stop, how useful it is, is defined by how many people are near that stop. If you are within a quarter mile or a half mile of a transit stop, that transit is useful to you. If you are not, it is not. 
So how much ridership we get is directly related to that density. Here's Honolulu, actually a very high transit ridership city, and you can see exactly why. It's a narrow strip of dense places in between mountains and the ocean, and a transit system that fits that. This is one of the maps I have for all the metro areas in the book. The light-colored area is frequent transit service, so every 15 minutes or better, at least five days a week um, through the midday. And there you can see a transit system that matches density well. We have to realize that when we talk about density, we are not talking about a regional scale. I frequently see people say the average density of a city is, the average density of metro areas. That is a meaningless statistic when it comes to planning transit because people are not evenly distributed. And what matters is the density next to that transit. This is a rail system in Dallas-Fort Worth, which is the U.S. metro area that has built the most rail over the last couple of years. And at first glance, this looks really impressive. You will see a lot of lines on the map going very far. But that's not what matters. What matters is where the stations are. Every one of those stations is a little quarter mile, half mile circle of walkability. If you're in one of those circles, then this system is useful to you. Or if you are within walking distance of a bus line that connects to rail, this system is useful to you. If you're not, it's not. And what you can see here is a system that really doesn't match that density well, that misses a lot of those dense spots. And that also means that every transit discussion is a land use discussion. This is the city of Portland, Oregon. Everything in yellow is single family zoning. What that means is the city of Portland is legally limiting how many people are allowed to live next to transit. This is what we do everywhere. We make land use rules that determine how useful transit can actually be. We can do this well. Um, here is an example of um, a new development in Arlington, Virginia, where you can see a brand new BRT line, dedicated lanes, beautiful station right in the middle of a new development. This is transit and density working together well. And if you think about our cities, places like New York were literally built around transit. But just because we have transit and we have development does not mean we are making transit better. This is outside of Dallas, the City Line Bush Station. In 2013, this station was literally open fields. This map shows the footprints of all of the buildings, and you'll notice there are none. In 2016, that station is now 2.6 million square feet of office space, nearly 4,000 residential units, 230,000 square feet of retail and restaurants. Transit ridership went down over that period. There are actually fewer people using the station now than there were when it was totally open field. So this is transit-oriented development, but it's transit-oriented development on an outer radial line of a radial system, which means if you happen to live in one suburb, that train will get you there. Everybody else has to ride into downtown and back out. It's a line that runs every 20 minutes, so it's not terribly useful. Just because we build stuff next to transit, if the transit isn't useful, that's not really transit-oriented development. And one of the things we found is that a lot of the most successful development around rail lines is actually in places that already had activity. If we want to see new development around transit, we don't have to build transit through empty fields. This is downtown Houston right here, and the map at the top, colored in, shows every new building that has been built along that rail line since construction on the rail line started. So you can see that rail and any kind of high-quality transit investment can really change places around it if we build it in the right place. We talk about density. I will say that, in general, the densest parts of Seattle are pretty well served by frequent transit. And likewise, the first rounds of light rail are doing a pretty good job of getting there, even East Link on the other side. But what's notable here is that as you get further out to the edges, you'll notice that there's some real pockets of density that aren't served by that frequent service. Um, if you compare the footprint of frequent transit in Seattle to frequent transit in Houston, you'll notice that in Houston, you actually go further out in many areas and cover more of those pockets of density. So there is still real opportunity here to serve more places. But it's not just about where people live. It's everything else we do. This is the light rail line in Houston, and the reason it succeeds is what you see here. There is a major activity center, Texas Medical Center down there. There is downtown Houston. Transit that connects major activity centers together is successful transit. 
So, for example, one of the top commuter rail lines in the United States, Caltrain in San Francisco, it has San Francisco on one end, it has Silicon Valley at the other, it has Stanford University along the way, it has a series of small town downtowns. That's what good transit does. It connects centers of activity together. And we have those in every city. We tend to think a lot about downtowns, but it's all those other places as well. So, for example, the Green Line in Boston, the highest ridership light rail per mile in the United States. It goes to downtown, but it also goes to Back Bay, another major employment center. It goes to three major universities. It goes to a major medical center. That's how you get good transit is you identify these places and connect them together. And when you look at how cities have built out their systems, they've often failed to do that. This is Los Angeles. Here's the first round of rail and BRT investment in L.A. laid on top of employment density. And notice how it's missing many of the most important employment centers. Next round does much better. But figuring out where those jobs are and getting to them is incredibly important. And once we're serving them, getting those stations in the right place. This is that same Texas Medical Center I showed you. And the key here, the light rail stations are right in the middle of things. Purple is the hospital. And there you can see those walkable circles for light rail. Three stations adding up to about 13,500 boardings on an average weekday. Here is the equivalent in Dallas. There's actually more jobs in this medical center. But the stations are off on the edge rather than the middle. Only about 3,000 boardings. Getting every one of those stops in the right place really matters. One of the things more places are really starting to do is think about multiple centers. The purple line in Maryland, for example, simply connects a string of major suburban employment centers and a university together point to point. And I'd say East Lincoln, Seattle is a really good example of that as well. But this isn't just about jobs. So if you think about your day to day, if you had transit to take you to your job, but you did not have transit to take you here, which luckily you do, but if you didn't, you would not have been able to use transit for the day. You can only use transit if it gets you to all the places you're trying to go. And this especially becomes important because if we think about people's household budgets, if we want to help people live more affordably. Driving less doesn't save you a whole lot of money because a lot of the cost of a car are fixed costs regardless of how much you drive. That's true for the insurance. That's true for a lot of the maintenance. It's definitely true for the car note. Being able to live without a car, being able to live with fewer cars definitely saves you money. And that really matters because there's a lot of people who are on the edge income-wise where that can make a real difference. And that means if we want transit to be useful to somebody, it needs to be there on a Sunday morning when they want to go to church or they want to go to the grocery store. And if that transit is not there for them, then transit isn't there for them at all. And besides, that grocery store on a Sunday morning has somebody working there. And that's one of the things I think we do really wrong. We don't live in a world of nine-to-five jobs. People work all sorts of shifts. There are bartenders who are going to work until those bars close. If transit stops running at midnight, transit is not there for them. I've seen cities that have airport transit that runs five days a week. There are very few jobs at the airport where your boss will never tell you, just come in on a Saturday or Sunday. And if you have one of those jobs, the transit isn't there those days, you're not going to be able to use transit at all. Next, walkability. Transit is all about walking. There is no high ridership transit system in the United States that gets the majority of its boardings from park and ride. And even if you do park and ride, you're not going to have a car at the other end of your trip. Everybody is a pedestrian or a bicyclist on at least one end of their transit trip. This means we need to think about basic infrastructure. In Houston, we built a $300 million light rail line, and this was the sidewalk leading to it. Sidewalks are part of a transit system. A transit trip is door-to-door, -door, not bus stop to bus stop. And in transforming that sidewalk to what now looks like that sidewalk, you made that a better transit system. Really basic stuff, like this is an example I saw up by the university today. Every bus stop should have a crosswalk. A crosswalk is basic bus stop infrastructure because guess what? You're probably taking the bus on the other side of the street to get back. You can't get there safely. That isn't useful to you. But it's not just small-scale infrastructure. It's also networks. This is downtown Houston. Big Circle is half-mile. 
as the crow flies from this transit station. And light colored is actual walking distance half mile. It's a grid, so the actual walking distance half mile is a diamond rather than a circle. But nearly everything here is accessible. That's Rosemont in Chicago. What you have here is a transit stop where the majority of that circle is not actually accessible to you as a pedestrian. There's a famous example in Atlanta of two houses whose backyards border, and the shortest distance between them is five miles or so. These roundabout street networks make transit really hard. And good transit systems think about that. So, for example, this is Atlanta and Decatur. You have a rail line that generally follows the straight rail line, but as it gets to downtown Decatur, swerves away and stops in the middle of the walkable street grid rather than at the edge. This is what makes transit useful. And I think this is something Seattle will confront more and more as time goes by because as the light rail line is moving out into the suburbs, you end up dropping light rail stations in places where the pedestrian infrastructure isn't there, where that circle has a lot of stuff in it that isn't useful. One of the major problems with building transit along freeways, for example, is you drop that circle right there, and it turns out the majority of the circle is freeway lanes. And it turns out nobody's riding transit to get to a freeway lane. We also have to think about connectivity because no transit line works by itself. If you look at successful transit lines, they are all about what they connect to. Here, for example, the North Line in Houston with every bus route that line meets. We were able to redesign the bus network in Houston because we were able to build new light rail lines, and then redesign the entire bus network to better connect to those, create cross-town routes that got you the light rail if you wanted to go downtown, but that also got you to completely different destinations. This is the Kansas City streetcar, the highest performing of the latest round of modern streetcar projects in the United States. Part of that is it connecting two major centers. You can see Crown Center there in downtown. But another big part of that is how it connects to the bus network. If you're on the bus route up here, it'll take you downtown. The streetcar will take you to Crown Center. That streetcar makes that bus route more useful. That bus route makes that streetcar more useful. And that connection between the two is what makes it work. Something more and more cities are starting to understand. Richmond, Virginia redid their entire bus network around a new BRT line, saying this capital project is the opportunity to rethink a whole network. But that also means we need to think about how those connections happen. What does that transit center feel like where I change from one bus to another? Does it feel safe? Does it protect me from the elements? And also the invisible parts of connection. What does that fare system look like? This is Munich, Germany, which does this incredibly well. And the way they do it, if you ride from point A to point B on transit, your fare is the same regardless of which agency you ride on, regardless of which mode you ride on, and regardless of how many transfers you make. And guess what? There's really affordable weekly and monthly passes for all of those zones. So you can have a piece of paper in your pocket that is a magic pass to any transit anywhere in the city without even having to think about it. A good fare system makes transit easier to use. And it's also about how we think about modes. Um, so this is also Munich, and what's remarkable to me about this picture is you have streetcar slash light rail there, and you have a bus right there, and the only distinction you can see between the two is whether there's tracks under them. At the transfer stop, they are treated totally equivalent. Same passenger information, same bus stop amenities, even the way you pay, they both have ticket vending machines on board. In the United States, we have this tendency to sort of treat buses as a second-class mode, and that really shows up in the transfer stations. Um, the station at Husky Stadium here is a great example of how light rail integrates with bus. I mean, you think of all the different bus routes that feed into what that one station. This has genuinely made transit faster, more reliable for an entire slice of Seattle. But look at the station. Look at the quality of the light rail station and look at what the bus stop looks like. Even ask the basic question of, can I get from one to the other without getting wet if it is raining? Which is a very relevant question to ask if you are in Seattle. I was just up in Toronto, and what they do is bus to subway transfers covered inside the fare gates at a lot of their stations. It really makes a difference. Next, let's talk about frequency. This is probably the most important thing in making a specific transit route useful, and it really shows up in ridership. Here's Chicago right here. 
at this spot, we have two choices of how to get to downtown. We can take a train or we can take a bus. And if we listen to the general transit discussion, we would all assume that everyone will want to take the train. But in reality, only about 100 people a day catch the bus here and a 1,000 catch the train and a 1,000 people catch the bus. The reason? That, train's every, that bus is every 5 to 16 minutes all day. The train's only once an hour. Frequency is everything. Frequency means is transit there when you need it or do you need to plan your life around it? What does hourly transit mean? Hourly transit means you might have a choice between being five minutes late or 55 minutes early. And this really shows up. Las Vegas, Nevada outperforms its peers dramatically in terms of transit ridership. Similarly sized place, Cincinnati, Raleigh, Milwaukee, San Antonio. What's notable about these is some of these are cities whose land use patterns are actually much transit friendlier. But Las Vegas has much higher ridership. It's not because they have a snazzy monorail. It is because they have one of the biggest frequent bus networks of cities their size, and it's a frequent bus network that goes to where a lot of the people live. Shows up on other things, too. For example, Denver has one of the highest performing commuter rail lines in the United States. It's up there with Caltrain in San Francisco, New Jersey Transit, Chicago. These are cities that have been built around commuter rail for 100 years. And meanwhile, Denver built a light rail line that is literally running through empty prairie that is outperforming them. Why is that? This is the only commuter rail line in the United States that runs every 15 minutes all day, seven days a week. It's genuinely useful, and people are riding it. Of course, you should look at this and start to ask, why doesn't New Jersey run their trains every 15 minutes? And that's a really good question. Travel time. How long does it actually take you to get somewhere? We talk a lot about speed, but that's not what matters. What matters is door-to-door -door travel time. If you think about a transit trip, it is walking, it is waiting, it is riding, and it is walking again. And optimizing every one of those is what makes it work. So, for example, putting a station in the right place makes a transit trip faster because it reduces the walking time. We want to go fast, but where we want to go fast is in between stations. If you're trying to build a shortcut between Santa Fe and Albuquerque, absolutely. Speed up that train, put it in the freeway. But when it comes to the stations, put them where people are actually trying to go. But that's not the only thing to speed. Routing matters. This is not a fast bus route. Have fun tracing that one out. Um, but... If you look at mature transit systems, they also achieve speed by layering. This is San Francisco. We're at the corner of Church and Market. This light rail goes downtown. That streetcar goes downtown. But the light rail dives into a subway. Um, so the light rail will be faster, but with fewer stops. So if I'm just making a trip on Market Street, streetcar is better. If I'm coming from the outer neighborhoods, light rail is better. And guess what? At the outer end of the light rail line, it meets a heavy rail line that also goes to downtown San Francisco. Again, light rail serves to place it along the way. Heavy rail is faster. This is one of the most successful heavy rail systems in the United States, one of the most successful light rail systems in the United States, and one of the most successful streetcars, all on the same street in parallel to each other because they're serving different kinds of trips. One of the things we get wrong sometimes is try to do transit that tries to do too many things. So, for example, imagine I've got a city here, I've got some suburbs, I've got some employment centers, I've got a dense core. One approach to that is to say, I'm going to try to optimize getting out here. So I'm going to minimize stations in the core so trips from the suburbs are faster. Another approach is I'm going to try to put more stations in the core, which is going to get me higher ridership, but it means the trips from the suburbs are going to be slower since that train's going to stop a lot of times along the way. If you look at successful transit systems, what they usually do is both. One system that serves as the express system, another system that has the more frequent stops, connection points between the two so I can jump from one to the other. But it's not just speed, it's reliability, because reliability is what gets you fired. Reliability really matters, because if you keep showing up to work late because your transit isn't reliable, you literally will not have a job anymore. Um, and it's one of the things we are the worst at. This is some great data from the Twin Cities. Um, this is the local bus route that got replaced by the A-Line up there. What does a bus spend its time doing? 
Up there, they found 42% of the time it was moving or stuck in traffic. 23% of the time at a red light. And 32% of the time boarding passengers. We can make every one of those faster and we can make every one of those more reliable. So, for example, dedicated lanes equals faster and more reliable travel time between stations. It's amazing how little we do this. Here are modern streetcar lines in the United States. Everything in green is dedicated. Everything in red is in mixed traffic. We are investing an awful lot of money in building unreliable transit. But it's not just dedicated lanes. What happens at the intersections? We can do signal priority. We can even do things like this. This is Grand Rapids, Michigan. That bus is able to make a left turn from the right-hand lane thanks to a dedicated transit system. Just not having to merge through that traffic and being able to place the stop closer to the intersection, that's a big deal. And finally, boarding. Um, Off-board fare payments, boarding at all doors, even simply having good wheelchair boarding, level boarding even for buses, all of those things will make transit faster and more reliable. And again, there's some good examples here where you've got rapid ride where you do all-door boarding, but why not do all-door boarding everywhere? San Francisco has gone to all-door boarding on every bus on the network. And, of course, there's other factors. If you run commuter rail and share with freight rail, that will obviously make a difference. And even things like basic operational things, agency culture. We found in Houston that one of our biggest on-time performance problems is lack of operator restrooms. You figure those things out and you fix them. And then capacity. Now, I think people obsess about this too much. We talk a lot about high-capacity transit. We can run all the numbers. In most cases, capacity isn't our biggest problem. And capacity is a complicated issue um, that in Houston, for example, we're limited to two-car light rail trains. We're limited to those trains because that's the length of a downtown block, which means the Allen brothers showing up in 1836 decided what our capacity of our light rail system would be today. There's a lot of history in this stuff. There are some places, though, where capacity is an issue. We have bus corridors in the United States that are carrying as many people as rail corridors. Those are probably good places to invest. And we have some rail corridors that are really running out of capacity. So there's things we can do there. We can do express tracks to get more capacity. We can do BRT systems where multiple buses can stop at the same station at once. Hartford, Connecticut has a really nice example of that, where they can run express buses and local buses simply because they have four-lane stops at both of those systems. But then from capacity to something we talk not nearly enough about, legibility. I love this picture right here. This is Santa Monica, California. You can see the beach in the distance. You can see the sidewalk that gets you there. You can see the transit station, and the train is telling you where it's going. Everything you need to know about taking transit to the beach, you can see in this picture. Good transit is legible. This matters for people who make different trips every day, which is a lot of transit riders. And it matters for new riders. If we want to grow ridership, we need to make transit easy to understand. Part of that is things like branding. This is one of my favorites, the Roaring Fork Transit Authority in Colorado with their Velociraptor. Hey, that makes transit a lot more approachable. It makes it easier to understand. It causes more people to use it. But a lot of it is just very basic stuff. I mentioned this earlier. This is the A-Line in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I'd argue the best local bus route in the United States. And part of the reason for that is it's extremely legible. Here is a bus stop. Right there is a timetable, full schedule information, and a map. Everything you need to know about riding this route, including fare information. Right here, real-time arrival information displayed for you. And then here, perhaps the most radical stuff. First of all, it tells you which direction the bus is running. This is a very important piece of information that most U.S. bus stops do not have. Imagine if you were driving... And there was a sign that said I-5. And it didn't say north or south. It just said I-5. And it expected you to know the geography of the city well enough to know if this was your on-ramp or not. That's how we treat buses. So number one, direction. Number two, the stop has a name. We know that rail stations have names. Why don't bus stops have names? As if that stop has a name and that same name gets announced on the bus and that same name gets shown on the system map and that same name will show up if you look it up on Google. 
you've suddenly made that system easier to use. There's a lot of German cities where every single bus stop has a unique name, and it really makes things easier. It's notable how different the level of information we provide to rail and to bus is. And there have been real improvements here recently, adding things like destinations on these signs, but I would argue we could do a lot better with Wayfinder. Maps also matter. This is the Houston bus map, red every 15 minutes, blue every hour, green every, sorry, blue every half hour, green every hour. This is a map that helps you use the system better. And system structure matters. This is a chunk of Minneapolis-St. Paul. In fact, it's Northeast St. Paul. Every color is a different route number. Every line is a different version of that route. There are five versions of the number 64. Four of them have letters attached to them. One of them, for some reason, doesn't. If you're up here, there are two versions of the 64 on the same street. They both go downtown. One of them goes northbound on its way to downtown. One of them goes southbound. This is a system you will be able to figure out if you take the same exact trip at the same exact time every day. But if you're a new rider, we are actively discouraging people from using transit. This is another fun example. Due to Alaska, as far as I can tell, has as many bus routes as they have buses. <laughs> like, seriously, are, are you going to remember that I have to catch the 11 or the 16 or the 14 or the 9 or the 6 or the 5 or the 4 or the 15 or the 3? And then finally, one more point, inclusivity. Good transit has to be welcoming to everybody. And to be blunt about it, part of the problem with U.S. transit is it tends to be planned by white, middle-aged men. And that shows up a lot. It shows up in the fact that transit is very much designed for nine-to-five commuters when, like I said, a lot of jobs aren't. It shows up in discussions like fare enforcement. Proof of payment fare collection is awesome. It makes transit faster. The idea of fare enforcement using armed police officers, there's a lot of people in the United States whose history of interactions with the police is not a positive history. So if you go into a low-income African-American neighborhood and talk to them about fare enforcement using armed police officers, you're probably not getting a good reaction. You need to think about those things. Even to me, one of the most basic ones, Stroller policies on transit. You want to take your kid on transit, mo most transit agencies say is, you need to fold your stroller. Okay, let's think that through. One arm holds the folded stroller, one arm holds the kid, and one arm holds the fare card. I just accounted for three of your arms. If we want to make transit family friendly, we have to adopt different policies. We may even have to design the vehicles differently and have a space on there so that stroller doesn't have to be folded. Okay. This stuff is basic. If you have ridden transit, you know all of this already. Transit planning is really quite simple. But if you look at U.S. transit systems, the performance we get is so hugely varying. Look at ridership on the Green Line in Boston compared to the Green Line in Cleveland. And some of this is due to urban patterns. Some of this is due to city density. But the variations between similar cities are also very dramatic. So transit planning isn't hard at all. I mean, you look at a city, you want to figure out density. It turns out a city is a vertical bar graph of density. Just get in a high spot, and you can immediately see where, see where transit needs to go. So map population density, identify your major centers, draw lines between them, you have a good transit plan. What do we actually do? This is East St. Louis, Missouri, and that is a light rail train running through a cornfield. There is no such thing as transit-oriented agriculture. Here's a map of some U.S. rail systems put on top of density. And what's notable to me about this map is how hard these systems are trying to avoid density. <laughs> this looks like airliners dodging thunderstorms. Whenever the rail line gets anywhere near where people are, it goes in the opposite direction. So why have we built so much bad transit in the United States? Why do we do this wrong so often? 
So a couple of reasons for that. The first is we think way too much about modes. I'm kind of tired of having the bus versus rail conversation. I'm not saying there isn't a place for it, but it's not where the conversation should start. I, I love this picture right here. This is a bus having an identity crisis. Um, but I'll give a good example of why this, why this matters and why this conversation takes us in the wrong places. This is Cincinnati. You will notice four major activity centers, five major activity centers in a straight line. This is a perfect example of a transit corridor, and Cincinnati was smart enough to realize it, and they say, our highest priority is connecting these five centers. But then as they started talking about it, they added another thought, which is people like streetcars, and specifically they were convinced that millennials like streetcars. Um, and so they start talking about we're going to build a streetcar to build, connect those five places. And they got really excited about the streetcar part. And what happened is they lost a lot of their funding. The state wouldn't cooperate. The utilities law didn't work. They couldn't build what they wanted to build. But instead of hanging on to the thought of we have five centers to connect, they hung on to the thought of we want to build a streetcar. So they built a streetcar that connected one of the five centers together. If we have a conversation about moats, Instead about what we're trying to accomplish, that's what we end up with. Anybody who makes a statement like, this city needs a streetcar, that makes no sense. The discussion we ought to be having is, we have a corridor connecting A and B together. We need transit service in that corridor that has this level of frequency and this level of speed and this level of capacity. And based on that, this is the appropriate technology to use. Let's have a conversation about destinations and service that leads to a technology decision rather than a technology vote. We tend to rush through system planning. It's amazing the level of detail we plan individual lines at, the environmental impact statements we do once we're designing a line, and the system plans are often sketched out on a napkin in the back door of the boardroom somewhere. I will say Sound Transit did a really good job with this latest round of actually being as transparent about that process as pretty much any place has been. But in general, we really rush through the most important decision, which is which parts of the region are we going to build. We think about individual lines rather than networks. Um, and again, it's how this fits together that matters. It's even on a basic infrastructure level. This is Boston right here. Bus subway, new tunnel to the airport, built at exactly the same time. If you catch the bus from the airport, it will go here. It will exit here. It will loop around. It will stop here. Then it will keep going here. It will loop around here. It will go in the tunnel here, and it will stop here again. If you're during rush hour, you can leap out of the bus here, run down the stairs, and catch the bus before yours, and actually save time by transferring to the same line. This kind of stuff matters. How stuff connects really matters. Another thing we do wrong is we plan single-purpose transit. So this is commuter rail in New Jersey. And the phrase I just said is the biggest problem. Because commuter rail is a technology. It's defined as trains that can share tracks with freight rail. But that word comes with a whole lot of other meanings. When you say commuter rail in New Jersey, what people think from that is, this is a rail line which is designed to serve white-collar commuters working nine-to-five jobs in Manhattan. And every decision about this rail line is made around that idea, the schedules, the fares, the connections to other systems. And I'll tell you why that's a problem. This is northern New Jersey right here, and northern New Jersey actually has one of the worst transit networks in the United States relative to its level of density. If you look at frequent transit density, there are a bunch of people here who are stuck on infrequent local buses. There is very high demand, very bad transit to serve it. And it's actually the kind of thing where cities, if this were in Seattle, people would be saying, we need to build a subway there. Here's what's amazing. This is that rail infrastructure. It turns out New Jersey already has the rail lines. It has double tracks, electrified rail infrastructure going through its densest places. Yes, it decides all of those people are going to ride local buses because they're going to use that infrastructure for a single-purpose service to get people to New York rather than to move people around New Jersey. 
This shows up in fares, for example. This is SEPTA in Philadelphia. Two rail lines, both taking to Philadelphia, both the same agency. That one costs $350. That one costs somewhere between $525 and $7. They even use completely different fare systems. This is a map of transit fares in Philadelphia. How much it costs you to travel to Center City depends on which agency you're riding, which mode you're riding, and whether you're making a transfer or not. This is far more complicated than it needs to be. And we get inefficient as a result of that. In this case, we're actually, they're actually running commuter rail service parallel to express bus service where everybody's riding the bus instead of the rail, even though the rail line's actually cheaper to operate, as well as more reliable and faster, simply because the agency thinks commuter rail is a premium service and it charges extra for it. We don't use data. We still have this problem that we use GIS to draw maps after we've made decisions, rather than take advantage of all this data we have to make better decisions. We know a lot about where people ride transit, and it could shape better networks. We think at too large a scale. This is BART in San Francisco. This train is literally going to cross two mountain ranges before it gets to its destination. And look at this land use. This is not transit conducive land use right here. If you look at the BART network, yellow is the latest round of expansions. The thickness of the red lines is ridership. They have invested all of their capital dollars into the lowest ridership parts of the system. There was actually a period in which they expanded the system by 50% and lost ridership over the same period. Why do we do this? There's a couple reasons. Some of this is political, which you are very much familiar here. I can talk about things like sub-area equity formulas and the like. Um, so that in BART, for example, they have elected directors. And guess what? Every director wants a BART line in their district. Um, if you look at the DART light rail system I showed you earlier, it had two basic planning principles. One was build as much rail as possible, and two, put a station in every member jurisdiction. It met those planning principles brilliantly. Carry as many people as possible, not a planning principle. Um, but it's also a different issue, which is how we draw maps. So here are two maps of the San Francisco Bay Area. This shows the 38 Erie bus. That shows three different rail projects. The map on the right looks a lot more impressive. But that single line on the left carries more people than all three of those combined. There's a mapping problem here. Simply stuff that looked impressive on a map doesn't correspond to the stuff that's most useful. We also tend to pick easy paths instead of thinking about destinations. Transit is not a vacuum cleaner. If I have a congested freeway and I put a train in the middle, the train won't just magically suck up all the cars. It needs to actually go to where the cars are going. And some of our biggest issues with low ridership rail systems are very much based on this. This is DART in Dallas. Everything in yellow was an existing freight rail line that they rebuilt as light rail. That is very easy to do. But it turns out what's around freight rail lines tends to be warehouses and not destinations. So we do a lot of transit where we pick paths that seem logical or paths that seem easy rather than where people want to go. And that's why Dallas has ended up with this system that skips so much of the density. And finally, we avoid opposition. This is one I was personally present at. That is a U.S. congressman in the parking lot of a hot dog stand in Houston at an anti-light rail rally. Um, this happens on a small scale as well as on a big one in San Francisco. They are boarding light rail vehicles from traffic lanes because the neighbors don't want to lose parking spaces. There are actually people in the public meetings saying that, you know, a couple passengers getting hit by cars a year is really not that much. Um, and so they compromise, and you can now board one car of the train from an actual platform, the other car is still from a traffic lane. So like that kind of low, small level stuff, but it also happens on a big scale. This right here is the light rail system in Norfolk. There's a very obvious corridor from Norfolk to Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach voted no, Norfolk voted yes, so they built exactly half of the system they needed to build. If you look at the geography of the rail line in Atlanta, that is entirely what the geography of MARTA is. Which of the white suburban counties did not want to be part of the regional transit agency and which counties did want to be part of the regional transit agency? 
running multiple networks in the same city and rail lines that just stopped because they hit this invisible line instead. This stuff shows up in city after city. This is Austin, Texas. On the right is the rail line they wanted to build, which hits their densest population, hits downtown, hits the state capitol, hits the university. Here is what they actually built, a rail line which brilliantly managed to, to avoid all of that, stops somewhere close to downtown, misses the capital, misses the university, and also misses the densest population. That was the line that bothered fewer people. That was the line that followed an existing rail line and had fewer opponents. And my rule of rail transit, if you propose a rail transit line and nobody is against it, it is a bad project. Because if you want to build good transit, you are going to build it in crowded places. You are going to build it in places that are in the way. And you need to design that really well. And you need to work with those neighborhoods really carefully. But ultimately, you need to put it in the places where it's most. This is that decision in Houston. Pick the easy corridor over here, rail line, power line, easement. Or you go over here where all the people are and all the jobs are and all the destinations are. That's what we need to do over and over again. We want transit to work. Ultimately, the bottom line is this. We spend a lot of time talking about trains and buses. Transit is about people. You design transit that makes people's lives easier, people will ride it. You have so many discussions about making transit sexier, making transit exciting. What we know in the United States is if we provide good transit, people actually ride it. The challenge is providing that good transit. And that's what this book is about. And I think if we have better conversations about transit, we'll ultimately build better transit. Um, follow me on Twitter, Christoph Spieler, but um, I'm happy to answer your questions there. Jeff Segura, and I'm an autonomous vehicle transportation trainer, and I'm also the chair of Young Professionals in Transportation Seattle. Um, I've been following equity most recently, um, especially coming here to Seattle, and I've noticed that there's redlining uh, GIS data available. Did you use that with any of your maps? I did not, but I think that's a fascinating topic. Um, if you look at the shape of transit systems and the shape of transportation networks and the shape of cities themselves, there is path segregation built into that in so many different ways. And often we end up doing decisions that reinforce that. I can't tell you how many transit referenda I've seen in the United States, which basically set up this idea of we're going to build a shiny rail line that goes out to the suburbs and we're going to add a little bus service in the city, which is a deeply inequitable approach. Most U.S. transit agencies, when they were founded in the 70s, were given a dual purpose. And I think this dual purpose still sticks with us today and is one of our biggest problems, which is U.S. bus systems were failing, literally falling apart. Buses were not able to pull out in service in the morning. They needed help. They needed funding. So that was cause number one is we needed to bail out these failing bus systems. Number two was... Traffic congestion was getting bad enough that people started talking about alternatives and people wanted shiny new trains to get them out of traffic. So transit agencies were done with those two missions, which were kind of just awkwardly stapled together. And most transit agencies still operate that way. They see there's a bus system and there's this shiny stuff we're building, and the bus system will operate competently. But those bus networks over and over again are operated in a way that essentially takes the people using them for granted go on this rant about the phrase dependent transit dependent riders because I actually think it's a hugely problematic phrase, dividing the world into transit dependent riders and choice riders because number one, when we start talking about choice riders, we have a tendency to picture the wrong thing. We're picturing a lawyer in a Mercedes and we're thinking they need USB ports and direct service to the airport. And in reality, that's not our target audience. If you want to think about growing transit ridership, you grow it in the middle. I just talked on Twitter about there are a lot of Americans who own cars and cannot afford them because simply they feel like they have no other choice but own a car to get to their job. That's a great person to provide better transit to because they need it. So first of all, the choice riders were focusing on the wrong thing. Second of all, as soon as we use the word dependent rider, 
we start to imagine that there are people who will ride our service no matter what, which means we can provide really crappy service and they will still ride it. That thinking explains the average U.S. bus ride. I mean, clearly we're building, we're running a lot of transit with the idea that we can take our riders to church. Um, and I think what, in general, we need to do is realize that making an existing transit rider trip better is just as valuable as getting a new rider. Realize that the basic dignity of every transit rider means we should have things like bus shelters. We decided a very long time ago that every street in a city like Seattle would be paved. When a street is in bad shape, the city does not run a cost-effectiveness analysis of how many people use the street every day and decide whether it's going to be dirt or gravel or asphalt. It gets paved. We don't do that with bus stops. With bus stops, it's like, well, only if the ridership is high enough, only if it meets these criteria. Why, why does every bus stop get a shelter? So I think that's, there's a very basic equity thing in how we think about transit modes and how we think about our transit network that we keep perpetuating. We keep investing the big dollars in the, in the systems that tend to be attracted to a higher income, whiter, and more suburban clientele. And I would say the most basic equity thing we can do in U.S. transit is count every person the same. Sounds really simple, but we aren't there right now. We, we, we value some of our passengers more than others. And we need to stop doing that. End of rant. Thank you. First off, first off thank you for a, an amazing presentation. I'm, I'm a transit writer, not a planner, and uh, I'm pumped Good. hearing this presentation. <laughs> My, my, my question for you is, um, since we have such a toxic federal government right now, yes. how does transit ha – what do you see happening? Because we need federal dollars. If you look at a country like Germany or Belgium, the federal government is funding these things. Yes. W and we have to cobble something together between Olympia and King County. W what do you see happening going forward? I, I, God, I mean, asking the question yeah. of – with this administration, nobody knows what's happening going forward, including the administration itself. Um, so it's really hard to predict. Um, I will say, I mean, I have lots of frustrations about our funding system. I, I think the way we do federal funding makes a lot of things worse. Um, part of one of the problems with the Dallas rail system is they actually wanted to put a light rail station at the airport, which would have required a tunnel. And the federal government says, well, that increases the cost of the project, it changes the cost-benefit ratio, and you no longer qualify. And therefore, you don't get any funding, no billion-dollar check for it. And the agency said, well, what if we pay for the tunnel ourselves? What if you – no increase in federal contribution, we pay for it ourselves? And the federal government said, sorry, no, cost-benefit, you won't get any money. So if you land in Dallas, um, the light rail line is within 200 feet of the runway, but it doesn't go to the airport terminal. That is the consequence of a federal funding guideline. So there are lots of things about federal funding that do not work very well at all. And I've made the argument before that if instead of our current federal funding program, we simply had a program that said the federal government will pay to convert your busiest bus route to a rail line, we would actually have more transit ridership in the United States today under that program than under the complicated program we've been running. So first of all, let's note that the way the Fed funds transit is not always productive. That said, that's important money, and obviously the Feds fund highways at 80% and transit at 50, so it's totally fair that that money go to transit. The big decisions, though, are still made locally, and I, and I think the cities that will succeed in transit are the cities that are doing good local planning and that are spending their local money well. So my advice to every transit advocate don't get caught up too much with what Congress is doing and focus on what decisions are being made locally. Because if the money is available in Congress and you make good decisions locally, you will get some federal money. The money is not available and you make good decisions locally, you're still making transit money. So that would be my fundamental advice for thinking about federal funding. Hey, thanks so much for coming. Uh, 
So given that Seattle is uh, investing so much in transit and particularly building out the new rail lines, what can we do to like help make sure that we build effective transit here? So, I mean, I would say, I was actually talking to a report about earlier today, this region is doing about as well as any region in the United States right now in terms of building smart transit, in terms of connecting different modes, in terms of having a regional fare card, there are a lot of really good things happening here. And that includes a lot of really small-scale things, some of the work around bus lanes, for example. I would say keep pushing on it. And keep pushing on the little stuff as well as the big stuff. One of the things to be really careful about is not get distracted by the billion-dollar projects and forget the little stuff. Forget that section of bus lane. Forget that bus stop improvement. Forget increasing frequency on that route in a way that will make people's lives meaningfully better. So I think keep focusing on the little things as well as the big things. But the most important thing, I sat on a transit agency board for eight years, voted on lots of things. If we had a controversial issue to vote on and 10 people showed up and told us to vote no and nobody showed up to tell us to vote yes, it was really hard to vote yes on that. It's really hard, the optics of I'm voting for this thing and every member of the public that's shown up has said to vote no. If we had that same issue and 10 people showed up and told us to vote no and two people showed up to tell us to vote yes, it was a lot easier to vote yes. Showing up to these discussions is so incredibly important. And in any level of decision, big one or little one, the anti-transit people tend to show up. The people who don't want transit on their street, they're going to show up. And so if we want to do good transit, a huge part of it is the public who actually wants good transit showing up. A huge part of it is strong advocacy organizations that keep pushing a huge part of it is good. Intra I love Seattle Transit Blog. Like, like the level of transit coverage you have in this region right here is awesome. Um, and that's genuinely helpful. It will lead to better transit decisions. It has already led to better transit decisions. I got appointed to the Houston Metro Bo Board because I wrote a blog, literally. Direct relationship. And so that's the final piece of thing I'll say is ask yourself, do I want to be an elected official? Ask yourself, do I want to be on an appointed board? Do I want to be in a policy-making decision? We need a diverse and smart and energetic set of people in those decisions, in those places. And if you're in those places, you can make an outsized difference. So that's the biggest piece. Just keep pushing. Because transit agencies will do good things if they are pushing.